Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca George. I'm the provost, and I appreciate you all uh, coming to this meeting today, and thank you for your time. It's my pleasure to introduce Martin A. Schmidt, the 19th president of Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Um, he took office July 1st, 2022, and he, prior to that, served as the provost at MIT, um, and I think he started in 2014. Um, Please, jo please join me in welcoming Marty. We won't go in any further, we'll just get to it. <laughs> wow, there's a certain air of formality that comes talking in this uh, <laughs> venue that I'm not quite comfortable with, and you all look like you're in the dark, so this is really, maybe, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, anyway, okay, so uh, this, is, this talk is longer than I normally would like it to be, but, you know, it's a little bit like that old line, you know, I'm sorry for such a long talk, but I didn't have time to make a short one. Um, so I want to welcome everybody. This is my second spring town. I can't tell whether we call this town meeting or town hall, and I've asked three people and got differing opinions. I'll call it town meeting, and, and then we can see if we like that. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Afterwards, you have to tell me why you like that name. Um, so getting ready for this, I couldn't help but um, reflect on the last 21 months of uh, um, what they've been like. So I want to share with you first my, some of my observations about those months. In many ways, my first year as president was really about getting to know RPI, getting to know all of you, including our alumni, and coming to understand both your concerns and your aspirations. As far as your concerns, Without a doubt, the dominant message from faculty and staff was about being spread very thin. I came to appreciate that over the past roughly six or seven years, you had experienced two periods of time that required tight fiscal controls. The first was the so-called crossover where RPI needed to work hard to reduce debt and grow endowment. That was successfully achieved, but then the pandemic hit and there were further needs to manage expenses in order to get through that challenging period. The net result was RPI had to reduce the size of our tenure, tenure track faculty and our staff, and so indeed you were spread thin. It was clear to me that we needed to address this because in many ways, this impacted all that we did, from education to research, to supporting each other, and feeling optimistic about the future. But we also discussed aspirations last year. And it was an opportunity to reflect on possible futures for this great institute, and indeed for the capital region. I think we all felt excited to think about the, those possibilities, but we did more than just reflect. As I learned more about RPI, we actively sought opportunities to have an immediate impact on things that mattered to you. You may recall I called these quick wins. Things that I saw we could do with relatively little effort but things that would have a nearly immediate and meaningful impact on your quality of life. We talked about this at last year's town meeting. In fact, probably the strongest positive reaction at that meeting came when I announced that we would eliminate the need to use PTO between Christmas and New Year's Day. <laughs> 22 months ago, I had no idea what those words meant, but that was certainly a quick win. Also, by this time last year, we had identified areas where we should invest to grow, to grow back to our historic size. And I was pleased to report to you at the time that the RPI Board of Trustees supported us in their approval of our FY24 budget. The principal area of investment to grow was in the addition of new faculty and staff to begin to return RPI to its historic size. The second year has been about developing a plan for our future, the Rensselaer Forward Plan. I am, of course, still trying to listen to your concerns, but we are in the midst of pivoting from quick wins to what we hope are big wins. Big wins that have in their origin an investment to grow. The quick wins were implemented, the quick wins we implemented made some parts of our life here better, but in and of themselves, 
They are not the wins that transform this institution. Big wins should have transformative impact at RPI. But here lies the rub. Big wins don't generally happen fast, with some exceptions. I actually believe our investment in quantum computing can be a big win. It happened fast, and I believe that the impact of that investment will be felt soon, and I'll talk more about that later. But for most of the big wins, the seeds of our investments will, will first emerge as sprouts from the soil that only some can see and that aren't necessarily visible to everyone. Further, the positive impact of those sprouts may not be felt everywhere immediately. For example, if we invest in more staff in the Vice President of Research Office, as we have, maybe you individually will notice that you had greater support in getting a proposal out the door. But the broader impact will be when that increased volume of proposals brings new and meaningful sponsored research revenue that not only funds your research and our graduate students, but brings indirect cost recovery. Those indirect costs can be used and invested in areas of need, like allowing us to add much needed journal subscriptions to our libraries or to fix our facilities and campus. I decided to start with these observations as a framing for this discussion based on what a few of you recently shared with me. So a few weeks ago, I sent an email to about 15 of you, students, staff, and faculty, somewhat randomly selected, and I asked, what do you think the community wanted to hear from me in this town meeting? I got a lot of good ideas, and I hope that I addressed some of them in my remarks. But several of you touched on one theme that really stood out to me. So let me quote several of the comments related to this theme. One of you said you saw a growing sense of frustration that change isn't coming faster. In that same note, this person said, maybe it's not a frustration about a lack of change, but more a worry that some things can't be changed. Another person wrote to me and said, I hope you will inspire us to be patient. And this person further said, much has improved, so you need to enable us to celebrate our accomplishments. And finally, one of you said, if you want us to provide an amazing student experience, continue to be the world-renowned, be world-renowned in our faculty research and develop a strong sense of pride in our institute, people will do it if you tell us to. Okay, so I'm telling you, yes, <laughs> I want all those things and more. And I believe that we can do all these things and more, but we have a long journey. And what you reminded me, thankfully, what you reminded me of is that we need to communicate how we are doing in this journey and create the opportunity to celebrate our progress. One of those opportunities to celebrate will be when we cut the ribbon on the quantum computer in a little over two weeks. Please join the celebration and enjoy some quantum freeze ice cream. I'll have more to say about that later in my remarks. So let me summarize now with that introduction of what I want to discuss today. I want to tell you where we stand on the strategic plan. I want to highlight some important accomplishments that we've already achieved. I want to walk you through our current financial picture and discuss the opportunities that I see in front of us. I'll touch on some student issues, mention the Middle States accreditation, and talk about the bicentennial, and then we'll wrap up. Let's start with the Rensselaer Forward Strategic Plan. At my investiture, I outlined five themes for the plan, education, research, translation, regional engagement, and building a welcoming, inclusive, and accessible community. These are admittedly very broad areas. We then put together five committees. Many of you served on those committees, each devoted to one of these themes. We tasked the committees with gathering community input, including through the online idea bank, and coming up with ideas and thoughts for what we should do in these areas. Each of the committees went about their work in slightly different ways. We shared with you the draft reports in June. When the committees returned in the fall, we asked them to look at the community feedback, incorporate, as they thought appropriate, the ideas that were posted to the idea bank. Not all of those ideas were used, but we made sure that we were, that we were reviewed by the committee, committees. The final reports were shared with you in mid-October. Since that time, we began a process of organizing this work into a plan. However, there were a number of ideas posted to the idea bank and or that made it into the final reports that we felt didn't need 
to be in the strategic plan because we could just implement them right away. In other words, some of them were quick wins. Also, there were some ideas for which there was such strong support that we elected to move forward on them, like the creation of OSAT, the Office of Strategic Alliances and Translation. Since October, we've been working through all of the content of the reports and developing a framework for the strategic plan. I'll first admit that this effort has taken longer than I thought, particularly because of the many and wide-ranging ideas that were in the reports. I also want to say that May Lee has been working overtime to collate all this work and help develop this framework. The strategic plan, when it's completed, will effectively be in two parts. The first part is a vision for our future. Where do we want to be in 10 years? This vision is framed by considering how we see the world around us evolving, particularly how higher ed is being challenged and transformed. We want to envision what we want RPI to look like in 10 years in that world. What is our desired size? What is our scope? Where do we want to have impact? The second part is an execution plan. What are the things we should do over the next three to five years that will move us in the direction that gets us to our 10-year vision? We have drafts of these two parts of the plan, and we are now returning to the committees to get their thoughts and reactions. I am hoping the committees will see these as making sense and will provide feedback that we can, that we can um, incorporate. After that phase, we will begin to share the refined drafts with other members of the community. Community, I see this as a set of concentric circles where we share with ever-increasing numbers of people and gather feedback leading to the final plan. Since I failed in my prediction back in October that we would have this done by early 2024, I'll hold off on suggesting when this phase will be complete, but I believe it needs to be done by the early fall as we roll into some of our large bicentennial events. One thing I can say for sure will be in the 10-year vision is that we will have developed a plan and will be in the implementation phase of a comprehensive renewal of the campus buildings. That's already started as we are currently compiling space utilization information, which is critical, which is a critical first step in developing that plan. And we continue to explore as a pilot the renovation of a main campus building to support our computing activities. As exciting as it is to develop sweeping plans, I promise, promise that we wouldn't wait for the plans to be finished to make important changes. And we haven't. Let's, let me talk about the, those things that we have done. They're not quick wins, but they're actions that can lead to big wins. Recognizing that RPI was operating with about 80% of its traditional staff and faculty numbers, we moved aggressively on hiring. I'm really impressed with the work that's been done to bring on board so many people in such a short time. We increased the number of tenured and tenure track faculty from 277 when I started to 304 last fall, and we anticipate that with 23 searches currently underway, by next fall our faculty will number more than 312. We are also working to grow and right-size our staff and to optimize our operational processes and systems. I want all the members of this community feel, to feel supported in their work. We've reached for new opportunities in sponsored research and regional leadership, which is what I'll talk about in a moment. We move forward on the educational front, introducing a new bachelor's of science degree in aerospace engineering, a master's program in biomedical engineering, data science, and semiconductor technology, and an advanced certificate in program management. We did critical things to make life better for all the members of the community. We are in the site selection and design phase for an on-campus child care center, one that I've talked about since I first arrived here, and I'm frustrated that it's not done, but that's what happens. And I hope that we begin construction before the end of this calendar year. We increased our tuition benefits and put in place a much wanted flexible work policy for our staff. Provost Rebecca Dorge is in the process of strengthening an important job strengthening our teaching track positions by developing teaching track faculty career paths that include promotion documents, formal evaluations, and standard contracts. We also increased our graduate student stipend, 5.3% in this academic year and 4.5% in the upcoming academic year. That's a 10% increase in stipend in two years. Done after a careful analysis that included data from our peer schools, cost of living calculators, and information from our students themselves about their expenses. 
I believe that we should aspire to make RPI the best place to be a graduate student. And this is the beginning of the steps we should take to live up to that aspiration. At the same time, we ensured that this welcome change for our graduate students does not mean that it costs the faculty more to support a graduate student on a grant. Clearly, RPI needs to be competitive with other universities in this front. Overall, we have made changes to our graduate tuition policy to make it easier to recruit and support graduate students. For students supported on sponsored research grants, we lowered the tuition cost to those grants this year. This is a step, a first step of many steps we need to make to increase our competitiveness in this area. And we hope that boosting sponsored research will increase both the number of research assistantships available to our graduate students and the opportunities to be involved in groundbreaking work. Some of our most important actions, I believe, over the past year involved creating new offices and reorganizing others to make them much more effective and responsive. We've moved our enrollment and student life functions into the office of the provost to allow for much greater coordination on admissions, academic resources, and the student experience. And to reflect the fact that learning at Rensselaer occurs both inside and outside the classroom. For graduate student recruiting, we are working more closely with the academic units. I'm confident the programs which cut across academics and student life, like the ARCH, will benefit and are benefiting from a more integrated approach. We're being advised in this reorganization by a consultancy which specializes in operational and cultural change. And I'm very grateful and want to single out Peter Conversely and John Wexler for embracing the change and working collaboratively with Rebecca Dorsch. We've integrated the procurement organization into the VP for Finance to get greater alignment and synergies. The consultancy group is also helping our division of human resources as well, and is now, which is now reimagining the employee experience. Some of you in your comments back to me actually said that you see improvements here. We have much to do, but acknowledging progress, acknowledging progress, however small it might be, is the fuel, the fuel that keeps us working towards those big wins, big wins that propel us forward. Our strategic communication office was renamed the Office of Community Engagement and Communications. The new office led, led by two leads, Hannah Rodriguez Farrar and Pamela Smith, will focus on building a community that elevates belonging and will focus on our in inclusion efforts relationships with local community organizers, and will partner with HR as we look to build trust and engage our community. It's a start. As I mentioned earlier, we also created the new Office of Strategic Alliances and Translation to move the ideas of our students and faculty into the world. John Dordick has been working to build his team. This will greatly strengthen, I believe, our engagements with industry, and with the Severino Center moving into this office, we can create a more cross-institute focus on supporting those translation activities. This will also include clarifying and simplifying our IP policy to the benefit of our faculty and our students. We've begun a search for a new director of MPAC, co-chaired by Provost Dorge and Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Institutional Impact, May Lee. We did a community survey conducted by our search consultants that helped clarify the attributes we we're hoping in a new director, someone who can help us make a better use of an amazing asset, grow financial support for impact, and increase impact's impact both in the campus community and the world at large, and help us explore, as was the founding vision of this entity, help us to explore increasing ways to integrate art and creativity into all we do. So lots of reorganization, and some signals of improvement, but much more will come as we see the full potential of these changes. Let's now talk about our finances. Our strategic plan and capital plan are designed to set us on a path to do even more, but we have to accomplish everything within financial realities. Right now, about 60% of our revenue comes from undergraduate and graduate education. Unfortunately, in this fiscal year, our student revenues were $12 million lower than we had planned for two reasons. One, our freshman class was 98 students smaller than we had budgeted. And two, the amount of financial aid we provided to attract this class was higher than projected. We were able to balance the budget using one-time funds and expense savings. In truth, like all universities around the country without large endowments, we are in a challenging financial state. As we celebrate 200 years of history, 
It's also a time to chart a course for RPI for another 200 years. A course that I believe is possible, I believe absolutely is possible, and that ensures our next 200 years. But the impending closure of the College of St. Rose, which was founded 104 years ago, suggests that history alone offers little protection. And others in our neighborhood are facing challenges. Union College, which has a strong endowment to date debt ratio, recently received a negative outlook from credit rating agencies Moody's, mainly because of its tuition discount rate and concerns about enrollment. Clarkson is transferring its graduate teaching program at its Schenectady campus to Siena and reducing certainly certain academic programs on their main campus. Fundamentally, the path to the future to us is to develop more, a more financially resilient RPI. For institutions that rely exclusively on undergraduate web revenue, this is a challenging time. Students and their parents increasingly look to whether the education being provided has a positive return on investment. I realize that this is something that may rub some of us the wrong way because we see the transformative potential of a residential four-year education. But we need to somehow square this with the realities of today, which are a declining confidence in higher education amongst the general public, concern about ballooning student loan debt, and the so-called demographic cliff. Between 2025 and 2039, the number of 18-year-olds in the U.S. is projected to shrink more than 15%. Fortunately for us, RPI operates in a spark spot largely defined by our STEM focus, which stands us apart from many institutions that are struggling. But we can't rest. While I don't worry about the causes of the challenges the previous institutions I mentioned will wash across our shore, we can't rest, and we aren't resting. As we think about the long-range plan, underlying that plan needs to be a goal of a more financially resilient RPI. Our fiscal year 2025 budget, just approved by our, board, by our board, reflects exactly that. An overall strategy of diversifying our revenues, strengthening our business model, and elevating the RPI brand. Together, in fiscal 2025, 2024 and 2025, investments of over $49 million have been approved that will allow us to grow. While this investment will help us stabilize our core student revenues, much of it focuses on building our financial resiliency in three ways. Increasing sponsored research, increasing alumni engagement and giving, and expanding our educational reach by touching more and non-traditional learners, which I believe we can do by taking full advantage of our Rensselaer at Work team in partnership with the campus. And we're already seeing positive indicators in research. We had some significant wins in the CHIPS area. And as a result of investments in the Vice President Research Office, we are seeing some of those shoots come out of the ground, namely a higher volume of re research proposals going out. Some of you have shared with me that you see improvements in our support of this activity. In terms of alumni engagement, and I'm smiling, giving, there are some positive signs. On March 14th, we had our Pi Day Giving Day. We had a goal to raise $200,000. Well, when I checked at about 10.30 in the morning, we were past that $200,000 goal. In fact, as a preliminary tally, we raised over $485,000 from nearly 2,600 gifts in 24 hours. <laughs> and certainly a shout out to everybody who worked so hard to make that happen. But there's much more potential here. I spend 25% of my time talking to our alumni and visiting with them. There's potential here. And as we add key staff and institute advancement, um, we can harvest that potential. But also, we're adding institute advancement staff that are embedded in all five of our schools, in student life, in research, and in athletics. And we'll see even more. But some pace, patience with the pace of change will be required. We need to build our relationships with our alumni. We need to make them proud of their alma mater and imagine inspiring them to want to make a difference here. This requires growth in the people that engage these alumni. Of course, if you work in one of the areas where we are investing, you're already experiencing dramatic changes. 
But if you don't, you may worry that RPI is stuck in the status quo. You may feel that your area of endeavor is neglected. So please excuse the commercial metaphor, but in public companies, they have a stock price, which is not a bad proxy for results. People in every part of the company, from sales to facilities, can use that metric to gauge how things are going for the organization as a whole. As a university, we don't have a stock price. We, don't have, we do have rankings, but they are not the right measure of progress, particularly since they often measure inputs, not necessarily the fantastic outcomes of our graduates. And they historically have favored those institutions with significant resources. Now, I realize that talking about revenues and business models and stock prices probably makes you feel that we think too much like a business and not an educational institution. I get that. And I want us to develop better metrics, metrics that measure what we want to be and help guide our work and define our success. But metrics that everybody can see. These can arise out of our strategic planning process. As I've said before, we are one Rensselaer, and when one of us succeeds, we all do. So let's focus on our institutional success. We also need to understand where we have advantages so large, you could reasonably call them unfair advantages and to use them to help power growth. I see a few enormous areas of opportunity for us if we can skate to where the puck is going to be. To extend the hockey metaphor, there are particular fields of research and education where it is worth taking shots on goal. Not every shot will go in the net, but the shot you don't take are the shots you don't make. Now, properly, we've seen presidents uh, suffer when they don't properly acknowledge quotes. Uh, I'll just tell you that that is not my <laughs> quote. And if you go to Wikipedia, you can tell me who said it. As all of you know, RPI has taken what I think is a slap shot from the point in quantum computing, far ahead, of, far ahead of our peers. We are the only university in the world to have an IBM Quantum System 1 installed our, on our campus. And by the way, it's running. Let me explain why the, yeah. Let me explain to you why, to me, this is so exciting. And I'm sorry if you've heard me talk about this. I was going to talk to you about qubits and coherence and entanglement as if it could, but I'll spare you that. But let me just say that quantum computers will ultimately allow us to explore complex questions even the most powerful classical computers cannot answer. Right now, quantum systems are just emerging, but they are going to rapidly become extremely important because of their computational power, because that power makes them energy efficient. And because we have IBM's pioneering system on campus, RPI faculty and students are going to be among the first in the world to explore quantum computing's most promising potential applications. Just think about how exciting it is to know that weeks after the announcement that we were to get this computer, the students spontaneously formed the Quantum Computing Club. Spontaneously. And I think the membership has doubled or tripled in the past uh, months. We believe those applications of quantum computing will include drug discovery, modeling, and predicting new materials, and financial risk modeling. But there are many more, many more applications to discover that we will only learn about through experimentation with this amazing machine. With this infrastructure at hand, we are going to be able to attract the best faculty in the field, and they, in turn, are going to educate the best students. Having the System 1 on campus also represents an enormous opportunity for the region and its businesses. I hope that this region becomes known as Quantum Valley. Our investment in quantum is part of an overall focus on the future of computing. As you know, the Chips and Science Act of 2022 is putting substantial federal funding towards the goal of restoring domestic semiconductor research and manufacturing. RPI has already scored a number of goals in research and workforce development arising out of the Chips Act, and both RPI and the region are poised for more, thanks in part to the nation's best infrastructure for microelectronics research and development at Albany Nanotech. Cybersecurity, an area in which our students are traditionally among the best in the country, is another important field of opportunity for us. Fortunately, it's a focus of Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who last year spearheaded legislation to establish a Department of Defense Cybersecurity Academy program. That's something we really want to pursue. There's also opportunities to bring more biotech and bio biomanufacturing to region. The fact that Regeneron 
does all of their domestic manufacturing in Rensselaer County represents a huge opportunity for us to work to attract more of that type of activity in our backyard. Climate change solutions on energy are another area, area of opportunity thanks to the presence of New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, with its mission to invest in clean energy innovations and to help New York State realize one of the most ambitious, cli ambitious climate laws in the world. We simply have to figure how to take advantage of some of these assets in the region. We're working on that. And I do believe that these opportunities will arise through increased collaboration across the Institute that embraces all five of our schools. Let me talk a little bit about some student concerns that I've heard about. I've already talked about the graduate student support. Parking. Who knew? Who knew you could spend so much time on parking? This was an interesting year. Our largest flash, freshman class from last year came back this year with cars. And so our parking lots were at near capacity with permit holders. But it seems that some of the people in the lots this semester, in particular, were not permit holders. We've tried a few things to address the issue and made some missteps along the way. I hope that our most recent actions, which we communicated earlier this week, are starting to fix things. We can also talk about student safety. Last year, as many of you know, we had a few instances of students being struck by cars. I first want to say that we live in a world of distracted drivers and distracted pedestrians called by, caused by those little devices we hold in our hands. And so we need to be extra mindful of that when we are either driving or walking around the campus. That said, we need to constantly work to improve safety. Last year, we made interventions at several key intersections in the campus, but we should constantly strive to do more. And in that spirit, we've re-engaged with the city and with the new mayor, Carmela Mantello. We're also working with student leaders who are helping us understand the parts of our campus where we are particularly vulnerable. Our first mission at RPI needs to be keeping our students safe. Mental health is another important concern of students, and while I don't have anything specific to report today, I do know that this is something the provost is very keen on making a focus for her office as she comes up to speed on our current activities. I expect we'll be able to talk in future meetings about our plans here. Part of making a welcoming campus is making it easier to navigate for the members of our communities with disabilities. I'm delighted some of our student leaders are in the process of compiling an accessibility analysis that can help guide our changes, but meaningful changes here will take time given the nature of our campus. But we have to start, we have to start. I'm very proud and humbled by the way our students have responded to the evolving crisis in the Middle East and our community. In November, I had the great privilege of joining our student leaders for an interfaith vigil for humanity and community that brought people of all religions together to support each other. Men, members of our community are genuinely suffering over this crisis, so I encourage everyone to be respectful of that and be thoughtful in their speech and actions. Middle states. Our middle states reaccreditation process is on time and progressing with the ultimate goal of a community event in August to present our Middle States Committee's findings and to solicit feedback. I thank everyone who has participated in this Herculean effort, especially our co-chairs Emily, Emily Liu and Keith Mu Young. At this point in the process, if the Middle States Core Committee reaches out to you for evidence to help us make our case, I urge you to help. As I said earlier, one of the ways we are securing RPI's future is by elevating RPI's brand in Troy and across the world. Our 200th birthday and a lot of illustrious history are giving us the opportunity to do just that. We have a lot of great events to look forward to for our bicentennial celebration that will help us reflect on the past, acknowledge the present, and imagine the future. And as we reach for regional leadership, we are using these events to make it clear that this is a shared history with the city of Troy and including our neighbors everywhere we can. We will host a signature bicentennial event next month, the ribbon cutting and symposium for the IBM Quantum System One that will include a science reporter, David Pogue of CBS News Sunday Morning. Next month also includes a fantastic evening that will be hosted by RPI's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering to celebrate the fact 
that in 1835, RPI became the first American university to award a degree in civil engineering. This, there will be big celebrations in the fall for reunion and homecoming and family weekend. There will also be both a campus day and a community day, complete, I'm told, with a Ferris wheel, invented, of course, by George Ferris, Rensselaer class of 1881. We're also expressing our deep gratitude to our neighbors for inviting them, by inviting them to a special production of the musical drama, I Dream, about the friendship between Ralph Abernethy and Martin Luther King Jr. here in MPAC this fall. Our individual schools are also planning upcoming events. Professor Michael Oatman and Anthony Titus of the School of Architecture and senior lecturer Sarah Tack of our School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences are curating a special bicentennial exhibit of student work at the Chasen Building downtown. The School of Science will host a celebration of the 60th anniversary of our partnership with Albany Medical Center, which created the nation's first accredited bachelor's MD degree program. We will celebrate CBIS's 20th anniversary with a special series on health issues in Troy and open to the community. Our School of Engineering is planning a space day to honor RPI's history and leadership in space exploration. It'll include a discussion of some of the most fascinating topics for the future, including the search for life outside our planet, the potential uses of space in mining, manufacturing, or energy production, and the prospect of colonizing the moon and Mars. Graduation in this bicentennial year is gonna be particularly special. I'm delighted to announce that we will award an honorary degree to astronaut Reed Weissman of the RPI class of 1997. <laughs> Reed will be our commencement speaker. He is commander of NASA's Artemis II mission, which will conduct a lunar flyby with a targeted date of September 2025. This will be the first crewed mission to leave low Earth orbit since 1972. The goal of the Artemis program is to establish the first long-term human presence on the moon as a stepping stone to the exploration of Mars. I thought about this last night and I was reminded that the last time we left low Earth orbit in 1972 was Apollo 17. And it's particularly interesting to me that my commencement speaker for the class of 1981 was Harrison Schmidt, who was an astronaut on Apollo 17. So it's an interesting bookend for me. And I think we might also have some surprises up our sleeve for commencement, so I encourage you to stay tuned. This 200th year is shaping up to be a very exciting, so let me wrap up, let me wrap up with two things, an acknowledgement and hopefully an inspiration. First, I wanna acknowledge that the change we need to go through will not necessarily be easy or fast, but it is needed. And at times, maybe we need puppies and cupcakes to lift our spirit. So thank you, Lynn and Jojo. Second, let me come back to where I started and hopefully offer some inspiration. When I decided to apply for this position, I did so because I felt, and I do feel, that this next decade can be a transformative decade for RPI and indeed for the capital region. Why for RPI? Because, and I should say that this is more clear to me now than when I was sitting in my office in our home in Gloucester, Massachusetts in the summer of 2021. Because our nation, our nation cannot survive by relying on only well-endowed private institutions. Institutions like RPI need to find their path to survive and thrive, to continue to contribute to society as higher education has throughout the years. But we need to think deeply about what that future looks like. The architects of RPI, Stephen Van Rensselaer and Amos Eaton, had a bold vision in creating the first Polytechnic Institute in the nation. Recognizing that with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, being in a part of the United States that was an epicenter of that revolution, the nation needed a new type of institution. To quote Stephen Van Rensselaer in his letter dated November 5th, 1824, to Samuel Blatchford, who would be the first president of RPI, Van Rensselaer said that he wanted to establish a school, and I quote, for the purpose of instructing persons who may choose to apply themselves in the application 
of science to the common purposes of life. He went on to further say in that letter that, and I quote again, my principal object is to qualify teachers for instructing the sons and daughters of farmers and mechanics by lectures or otherwise in the application of experimental chemistry, philosophy, and natural history to agriculture, domestic economy, the arts, and manufacturers. Folks, this was bold stuff. And, I cer and certainly not was, ha was happening or being discussed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or New Haven, Connecticut, or Princeton, New Jersey. I believe this is an important moment for us. <clears throat> Can we think about an RPI with a similarly bold vision? The challenge, of course, is that we don't have one of the wealthiest persons in the world writing our new charter as Emus Eaton had in Stephen Van Rensselaer in 1824. And perhaps with a dose of humility, we can accept that perhaps this is a somewhat different moment. But is it? Is it really? And that brings me to this book, which I carry around a lot. Authored by some friends of mine and former colleagues at MIT, Simon Johnson and John Gruber, economists that have a thesis. Their thesis is that the nation cannot survive by a few super, superstar cities. Boston, New York, San Francisco, LA. You pick your favorites. Indeed, one can argue that much of the vi division we feel as a nation is a result of this uneven distribution of wealth. In their book, they offer a thesis that other metropolitan regions have the potential to excel. I say potential because it will not happen automatically. The region needs to lean in. In their book, they analyze a number of regions and identify 102 regions in the U.S. for which they believe this is possible. One of those regions is Albany's Connected Detroit. It's ranked 16 out of 102. I think it should be higher. But I'll have that conversation this summer when I go back to Boston. But I believe them. But this isn't our birthright. We need to work for this one, just as did the modern-day sons and daughters of Van Rensselaer, Ren Rensselaer's farmers and mechanics. But maybe, just maybe, we can together create a new RPI, an RPI that is as transformative today as RPI was 20 years ago, and led to many similar institutions in the ensuing decades. I believe this is possible. I believe this is our future. It will be hard, but nothing transformative is easy. The big wins will come, but they will take time and hard work. But that's why I want to be here, folks. I believe that RPI can capture this opportunity. I believe that RPI can transform this region. And I believe RPI can point the way for other similar institutions that can follow us. <clears throat> so yes, it requires change. And yes, that change is hard. And at times it may feel that it isn't coming fast enough. But my job is to inspire you, to challenge you, to support you, to lift you up when you stumble, and to celebrate you when you succeed. And I'll keep that in mind. And I suppose I ask that you return the favor, as you have done these past 21 months. I thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions. So I believe we have microphones in the aisles. Surely there's a question. There we go. Thank you. So hi, everyone. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Rhea Masoni, and I am the undergraduate president. And I have a question for you a little bit about um, the finances portion. So yeah. I know you touched a bit on it. Um, and in the past, um, actually up until 2008, students used to be a part of some of those decisions. And student representatives served on the Board of Trustees Finance Committee along with the Board of Trustees Student Life Committee. And then in 2008, those positions were removed. And the position on the Student Life Committee has been brought back since, but the position on the Finance Committee has not. And you've talked about how part of the issue is that people view institutions very much like ours as, you know, sort of a money grab and a place that it's more of a business than it is an educational institution. And so in sort of changing that view 
Are you open and will you be willing to bring back that student representative on the Board of Trustees Finance Committee? So Rhea, what I would say is that I think the goal should be that the board should have the opportunity to understand what the students' issues are and to be ensure that the management is attentive to those issues. And in that regard, I believe that the committee where we've reestablished student presence is the exact right committee to be there because that's populated by nearly half of the board of trustees. It has overlap with all the other committees of the board and it is really the forum where those conversations will happen and there's the opportunity to be heard. The other committees, I think it has limited value in terms of adding to capturing that student perspective. So I prefer that we do what we're doing right now. Okay. But Thank I appreciate you. the question. And I'm, as you know, I'm always happy to argue with you. <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you. We can always count on Sasha. <laughs> And then Gabriel, you're next. <laughs> right. uh, Marty, thank you uh, very much for the uh, talk, uh, the presentation, and all of the updates. Um, so to um, echo what you said, that it uh, was a bit sad, or that you don't want to view the institution as something uh, financially motivated or business um, oriented. That we are a research institution. Um, I just want to say that. Um, I was also a bit sad, yeah, that you didn't address the community in that sense that some of things that happened transformative around campus during the last year, uh, and this was perhaps not even the low-hanging fruit, but a big win, is the way the campus has transformed, um, the way that um, the culture of the RPI has evolved over the past years during your presidency. And um, I think that you should take a lot of credit for this. So thank you so much for what you've done for the campus, for the community. I. I haven't heard any person on campus who hasn't applauded what, how you have changed how people communicate and just trust each other. Um, in that sense, um, um, one of the investments that you mentioned and some of the long-term investments for which you don't see the immediate benefit and it's frustrating that the change doesn't come, you wait for it, but it, you believe in some things that pay off. And one of the things that I've heard repeatedly from some of the faculty who I respect the most was, um, again, community. And how big of the toll that COVID has taken, not so much on the financial state, but on the state of our institution as the beacon for academic discourse, um, discussions and arguments which lead to these research papers, proposals that you mentioned, that lead to these ideas that are groundbreaking, that don't and this, uh, these ideas, they don't, and again, I'm not crediting myself for this. This is from, from uh, one of the faculty, again, member who I respect the most. He said that these usually happen in just stupid situations. We pop up somebody in this office, you check in, you talk to him, you discuss some things, you laugh about something, you make a comment, and out of this comment arises an idea that leads to a, a paper a idea, that leads to a publication, that leads to revenue. Uh, I've seen this happen with myself just last week where I had a discussion with a student and with, with a group that we started and now the advisor has approved this idea to perhaps push for a publication. Okay, um, long preamble. Uh, now comes the, uh, the actual question. Um, uh, this this uh, pandemic has taken a large share of the graded community in terms of having these sort of beacons of communication that leads to, again, graduate research ideas. What, is, what are the institutional goals to bring this idea, uh, these beacons and these um, cultural groups back to foster them and to support them? Does the campus have a, uh, uh, this, our institution has a goal and a strategy to directly invest into having this specific culture? So, um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but I, I, thanks for the comment and the question, Sasha. Um, you know, culture change is hard. Uh, and, and so we are affecting change, but I think there's much more change to do. I'd say um, in response to your question, by bringing together an office that includes Pamela and Hannah, we're signaling the intention to focus on the community. And it is true, and some of you have heard me tell the story, but you know there are cultures and rituals from this campus that have been are at great risk of being lost because of the um, because of the disruption of pandemic, and um, so we need to figure out can we resurrect the ones that we want to and how, 
But also, I think, how do we encourage people to create those new traditions? Um, so I think that's one thing that we need to focus on. But I think the other one is, um, one of the things that struck me when I started here, and even just, um, I think sometime this week in a meeting, we talked about this, which is, I, I really think RPI is at an almost optimal size to allow what you just described to happen. And um, so as we think about our future together over the next decade, we can't lose that. And so, um, and that came out a lot in my listening tour early on because so many people said, you know, I can, the, the barriers are low, I can collaborate. I, and we had, oh, I know what it was. I think it was last night. It was the last night we had faculty up at the house. Some, we had some of the new faculty up at the president's house for dinner and we were talking and they all knew each other. Uh, three of them rode, rode up to the house together. Um, and that's amazing that all of our new faculty are a community. And it's not even, the year's not over yet. Uh, and I think it, those sorts of things, we have to create that and build that community. And, and that was faculty across all departments. So the sort of things you can describe, you describe can happen because they'll see each other across the campus. And so, so I think it's a great point. I think it's a, I, think, I know it's a focus for Hannah and Pamela and I think about what their office is gonna do. So thank you, Sasha. Can I have a follow-up question then? <laughs> Since no one's asking, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, but no long preamble. Yes, yeah, no preamble, <laughs> promise. Um, okay, I'm the president of the Graduate Council, which is part of the student government. So question is, uh, what role do you view the union in creating this uh, sort of uh, culture? And also specifically the Graduate Council, so this concerns graduate research. And are there any plans to, for the offices that you mentioned to work with the student government, the Senate, the Grand Marshal, and the uh, Graduate Council into uh, fostering these ideas and this culture? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I think, I, you know, <laughs> um, when I... Uh, when I went out on the road and went to 19 cities and talked to alumni, you know, one of the, I said that there were five frequently asked questions. And one of them was the student-run union. And the specific question is, when will you please re return control of the union to the students? I would ask the person, well, what does that mean? Because <laughs> I've been digging for like six months and I haven't really figured out what has massively changed. There have been changes, but what has massively changed? Um, and the person couldn't answer me. So, uh, you know, we, we worked uh, to try and um, understand that, and I think we made some headway with the alumni to help them appreciate that the students are um, playing an important leadership role in that. And I think it's great, and, and the joke I like to tell, and I'm looking, there's Peter, um, we were on the road somewhere and I got an email from an, a, a student, I hope the student's not here, <laughs> um, that, that basically explained to me that the, this student had a class at 8 a.m. and wanted to work out, but the Mueller Center didn't open until 8 a.m. And the student further pointed out to me that they understood that the reason it didn't open was because um, uh, staffing. And the staffing problem was because we didn't pay enough. And so therefore, Mr. President, please pay the staff more so that the union will open earlier. So as I always do, I send these to, to Peter Konwerski, and I say, Peter, tell me how I should respond to this question. Um, that was, I sent it at night. And the next morning, of course, Peter had replied, and it was in my inbox, and I read the email, and I got a big smile. Because what Peter told me was basically, Marty, you can't do anything. The Mueller Center is student-run. <laughs> like, this is genius. <laughs> This is genius. And to the student's credit, the Mueller Center opened early, I think two weeks later. So I'm all in on that. I think it's a great thing. So we need to work together. End of story, no more questions. Thank you. <laughs> From Sasha. <laughs> Any others? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Catherine Scavira. I'm actually, uh, previously, I, I came to RPI previously as an endowed chair of opera on the West Coast. And I came here because I believed in, fiercely in what was happening here, and I still do. So I just wanted to, uh, not so much a question, but just to implore you to consider the contract faculty, the, the people that have 
potentially more contact hours with students, but who are hourly, because we are really engaged with the community here. We're doing our own research, but we feel a disconnect with what you're saying and with what we experience week by week. Okay, I appreciate that. I don't know if Rebecca wants to offer any comments, but this is a big area of focus for the provost. Thank you so much. Any others? All right, Gabriel. I knew he'd <laughs> You convinced me, I'll bite. Um, first of all, you know, I do think that there has been a disconnect in between the actual substantive changes in student government over the past decade or so and kind of the rhetoric you see around that. So you're not wrong to be a little confused there. Thank Second you. is, this is unrelated, but I'm gonna be graduating soon. Um, I'm gonna be moving out to the West Coast for to work. Apple? Yes, for Congratulations. work. Congratulations. Um, and uh, I was wondering, you know, there are all these great initiatives, all these great ideas to um, propel RPI into its uh, third century. I'm curious, uh, in addition, aside from in addition to donating, what is the best way that, alum that new alumni can support the mission can support all these uh, initiatives. Like, what, what, can, what, what do you need us to do to help out? Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about that question, and, and I think it's, it's really um, starting with engagement. And so you'll be out in, in, in the Palo Alto area. Um, Nancy Mueller has a send-off party. I don't know if you went to it when you were, uh, well, no, you, you're, you're from uh, New York, right? Yeah. Um, so, so the students in Northern California that are admitted to RPI will come to Nancy Mueller's house. It's a beautiful home. It's across the street from where Steve Jobs used to live. Um, and it's a send-off. And it's great when the alumni come to that event. So what I'm saying, uh, Gabriel, is that, is that for our younger alumni, we want you to come together to engage and to pay attention to what we're doing and to look for opportunities to help. And it doesn't necessarily need to be money. It could be that you can create great arch opportunities at Apple for RPI students. I don't think I'll be hiring just right out of school. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I don't know. I've seen you at work, Gabriel. <laughs> so, so, you know, think about how you, what are the mechanisms of support? But, but it, I think it's also about building community Mm -hmm. amongst the alumni in the various parts of the country and the world that you are. And, that, and then we can, Matt's organization can support you in building that community. I'll come out to visit you. That's the journey so that, you know, when you have your third IPO and it's, it's do I get a big yacht or do I give to RPI, <laughs> we kind of know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> but thanks for the question, Gabriel. Thank you. All right, I think... Uh, it's exactly four o'clock. Thank you so much.